Good day. So good to uh, be here with you. Again, it's been a couple of weeks. It's been a kind of crazy fall here. A couple of more items coming up for me in the next week or two. I won't be here next week. And uh, also, on, uh, I won't be here the first Sunday in October, which I think is the 8th or the 7th. Yeah, the 8th. Anyways, we are starting a new sermon series October the 1st. It will be in Psalm 119. I, I, we don't have a title for that yet, but if you want to do some preparation for that, you can. You can read Psalm 119 a few times and prayerfully consider uh, that text as we lead into that sermon series starting October the 1st. So uh, let's get right into it. About eight years ago, uh, November 2015, the hockeywriters.com posted the results of a survey answering the question, who are the best NHL fans? And they used a number of factors to uh, get this information, which included the attend attendance percentages over the previous 10 years, so 20, uh, I guess 2005 to 2015, the merchandise sales, the TV ratings, social media interaction, uh, attendance versus performance over the past five years, and then they ranked uh, what was then 30 teams, one to 30. And coming into first place uh, with the best NHL fans, according to this uh, hockeywriters.com, uh, were the Chicago Blackhawks. And coming in last at 30th was the Carolina Hurricanes. You know, of course, many things have changed since 2015, as they always do in the sports world. And actually, one can't really put their finger on the fickle nature of hockey fans from one season to the next, and I happen to be one. But around the same time, Someone said concerning the state of the church in the West this, quote, the biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians. They want enough of Jesus to get the benefits without it requiring anything from them. Now, this is an interesting statement. And standing alone without any context, it brings up to mind a number of questions. And the one question that popped in my head was, are these so-called benefit-seeking fans that is they're talking about here in this statement, are they even saved? And do these fans have a biblical understanding of Jesus' teaching concerning discipleship that we find in the Gospels? Anyway, today our time will be spent uh, engaging with Matthew's Gospel, particularly chapter 6, we'll be there. There we have, I think, 34 verses of Jesus' teaching concerning kingdom living. And we are not going to be able to go through all of those verses. And the onus then, really, right from the get-go, will be on each one of us, if we so choose, to follow up with our own study, not only of Matthew chapter 6, but the Sermon on the Mount, and the Gospel, too, if you will. But we need to set our hearts and minds uh, in the right, right attitude as we begin this study. And so please turn uh, into 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 17 to 18, and we'll read those verses together. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you for this day. What a blessing it is to look at chapter 6 the, of Matthew's Gospel. And we ask, O oh Lord, by your Spirit that you'll help us as we w walk through some of those, uh, those verses and try to understand what Jesus was teaching his disciples and what he's teaching us today. It's very practical in many ways, and I, I pray that those who are listening or watching or doing both would understand that and uh, help us, Lord, not only to understand these things, but to put them into practice as well. We thank you for all these things, Lord, and we, we, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start with a story, and it goes like this. There is a man who thought highly of himself, so much so that he often treated others with scorn. And one day this man went to pray, and with his head and arms lifted up to the heavens, prayed, God, I am so grateful that I am not like so many others the unjust, the crooks, the cheaters, and swindlers. I pray three times a day, every day. I always give my offering out of all that I earn. There was another man. 
a man who cheated and swindled money from others, a man who lied and thought nothing of extortion. And one day this cheater and swindler who could not lift one finger heavenward, let alone his face, prayed, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Someone once said that, quote, self-righteousness makes genuine love impossible. Well, with this in mind, as we look at our text now, Matthew chapter 6, uh, we need to understand uh, always the rule is context, context. The Matthew 6 is right in the middle of what is called the Sar Sermon on the Mount here in Matthew. So starting in chapter 5 through, the, through to the end of verse 7. And of course, it's in the gospel itself and in the gospel accounts. Um, so what we need to understand, though, is... What I would like to do is go to verse 5, chapter 5, verse 20. That was kind of weird, eh? Chapter 5, verse 20, where we find the thesis, a the theme, if you will, of the, of the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus was speaking about here. Jesus said in chapter 5, verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So keeping this theme before us, chapter 6 continues where... Jesus left off in chapter 5, teaching what it truly looks like to be a follower of Jesus and living out that reality day by day in the kingdom of God on earth. Our text begins with Jesus saying this in verse 1 of chapter 6. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Why don't we just kind of camp around this for a moment? And let's look at another theme that is consistent throughout Matthew's Gospel, and that is the conflict between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees, these religious leaders and rulers of Israel in Jesus' day. We can go to chapter 23, and there we really see what Jesus thought and said about these Sadducees and Pharisees. We see in chapter 23, Jesus seven times beginning his condemnation of them with this phrase, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. So what he was doing here was calling out these spiritual leaders of Israel for their hypocrisy, for taking the law and the prophets and the old, the Torah and all that and turning it into a self-righteous, legalistic, legalistic prescription for salvation and a relationship with God. So we need to ask a question about these religious leaders, these Pharisees, these Sadducees. Were they earnest in their devotion? Yes, they were. Were they zealous to preserve and protect the law of God? Of course they were. We go to a, another book in the New Testament, the book of Acts. And then, there we see the events that recorded by Luke for us leading up to the Apostle Paul's conversion. But it starts in chapter 8 where we find Paul, who was then called Saul, uh, as Luke describes him, ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison, Acts chapter 8, verse 3. We go to the beginning of chapter 9. There we find Saul with letters from the high priest in Jerusalem to make his way to Damascus and round up any Christian that he could find in the synagogues in Damascus. And as he made his way to Damascus, he encountered Jesus, and Saul became Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And Paul describes his days as Saul in his letter to the Philippian church. We see that in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. Paul said, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. A Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Then Paul would go on to say in the very same letter, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered loss of all things and count them dung in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Can you see the contrast between Saul and Paul here? 
So, uh, so this was in Philippians 3, verse 7 to 9. Pastor Steve Brown of Key Life uh, presents five characteristics of self-righteousness. One, self-righteousness is subtle. We don't know when we got it. Two, it's cumulative. It never starts out as self-righteousness, but usually is something good. Three, it's addictive. We all love to win an argument, don't we? We all love being right, and we want more and more of it. Four, it's indiscriminate. In other words, when we actually recognize self-righteousness in ourselves or others, once we see it, we find it everywhere, not just in people of faith. And five, it's terribly destructive. And that brings up some questions. What were the Pharisees doing to deserve the condemnation of God? This uh, condemnation from God the Son. First, it's important to state, and we need to understand this, that Jesus was not condemning doing good deeds in the public space. That's not what he's talking about. Because we go back to chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, Jesus said to his disciples, and he's saying that to the followers of Christ, the genuine believers of Christ today, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So what happened to the scribes and Pharisees? Well, why don't we let Jesus answer this, this question? Let's go back to chapter 23 and listen to what Jesus says, said about these scribes and Pharisees. First, he said they tie up heavy burdens, which are hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves will not, are not willing to move them, for their, move them with their finger. And he went on to say they love the place of honor at feasts and best seats in the synagogue and being called rabbi as they're walking down the road. Then he said this to them also, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. He talked about their giving. He said, You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You find these in the first 39 verses of chapter 23. So what happened to the scribes and Pharisees? What was going on there? Well, they had succumbed to, they had given into the subtle, cumulative, addictive, and destructive nature of self-righteousness. They had turned righteousness by faith in God alone into a legalistic works righteousness. And this blinded them to their very own self-righteous sin. Here's another question. Let's turn it around. Let's bring it home. Let's bring it to you and to me. Let's bring it to the body of Christ today. As followers of Jesus, what should be the attitude of our minds and our hearts as we live out our days in the kingdom of God here on earth? Well, Jesus gives us the answers for us. And he began with that in chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, which we call the Beatitudes. You can read those for yourself, but here's the bottom line. When we realize our poverty of spirit, our sinfulness before a holy and just God, our need for forgiveness for Jesus every moment of our lives, then and only then will we have an understanding of why Jesus said the things he said about the scribes and fairies. What he, said, what he says today about self-righteousness. See, for the person who has succumbed to self-righteousness, I think they would be wise to hear Jesus, who said here in chapter 23, verse 11, he said to the uh, disciples and those gathered around him, Whoever's, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Pride goes before the fall, my friends. Well, with all this said, we have discovered, I think, a, no, I know, it seems to me anyways, a biblical principle regarding living in the kingdom of heaven. And let's put it this way. God gets all the glory. God gives all the blessings or rewards. You can put rewards there if you want. God, gives, God gets all the glory. God gives all the blessings. In other words, the believer's motivation as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven is one of commitment to righteousness, not self-righteousness. The follower of Jesus is, as Jesus put it so well in verse 33, to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then what? All these things will be given or be added to you. Therefore, God gets all the glory and God gives all the blessings. And not only is this a biblical principle that stands out here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, 
But certainly, it is a very practical, practical principle. And we put it into practice in our spiritual disciplines. For example, we put it into practice when we give to the needy. Verse 2 here in chapter 6. Don't be like the hypocrites, Jesus says, who broadcast their generosity to one and all to be praised by others. If you do this, you will have received your reward and God will not be glorified. But when you give the needy, Jesus said, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And in doing that, the Father gets all the glory, Jesus said, and he will reward you. You know, it's kind of interesting on the aside a little bit here that God loves these kinds of sacrifices. The writer to the he- of the letter to the Hebrews said this, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Hebrews 13, 16. Well, next, this biblical principle can be put into practice when we pray. Again, we don't, we don't want to be like hypocrites. We don't want to seek to, to be seen as a pious and godly person. We don't want to look for that in front of everyone else. Because that kind of praying does not glorify God. He talks about going into your closet. He talks about, you know, in secret and all those kinds of things. Again, we can pray publicly uh, in a public space, but again, we're not trying to be like hypocrites, are we? I hope not. So how is a believer to pray? Well, let me give you some suggestions from the New Testament. Why don't we start with thankfulness? Paul says, put it this way in his letter to the Philippians. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In other words, let your prayers, with thanksgiving, let your prayers be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6. So friends, we can pray with a thankful and grateful heart to God our Father. And how about this one? We should pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because according to Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians, first letter, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. 17 to 18. We move on to chapter uh, uh, Matthew 6, verse 16 to 18. And here it speaks to fasting. Now, this would be a great topic for another message. But sufficient for today is to understand that when we fast, Jesus reminds us not to be like the hypocrites and put on a gloom and doom face or appearance. But carry on as per normal. Get up in the morning, continue on per normal even as you are fasting and praying. Again, we keep in mind our biblical principle. God gets all the glory. God gives the blessings. And there's just one more important piece when it comes to all this. Because it's not just, it's just not these uh, disciplines we're talking about. We're talking about a relationship. Because that's what Jesus is talking about here, a relationship with God. What Jesus was teaching his disciples, my friends, and this passes on to believers today, is that God wants us to relate with him personally. And we can do that through Christ. We see in Matthew's Gospel, God is addressed as Father 45 times. In the four Gospels, we find Jesus referring about 70 times to God as his Father. So here, Jesus was teaching the disciples to give to the needy, to pray and fast to trust God for their needs, for the Father in heaven cared about every detail of their lives as he does for you and me. And no wonder, Jesus said, you start by praying, our Father who art in heaven. Well, from the practical disciplines of a believer, we have Matthew 6, 19, which introduces a new subject, but is not straying from the theme or the thesis of righteousness by faith in God alone that we have already briefly reviewed from Matthew 5.20 and here at the beginning of Matthew 6, verse 1, and as we will find in Matthew 33. And Jesus began this new subject by saying this in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So the question is, how does our biblical principle, God gets all the glory, God gives all the blessings, apply to possessions? You know, this is such a distorted thing sometimes in our culture, or certainly the Christian culture. How does this apply, this, this biblical principle apply to money, to our possessions, to, to everyday needs such as food and drink, to the very clothes we wear on our bodies? In other words, to the ordinary things of life that everyone needs and does. Now, there is a big difference. We need to understand the context when this was written. There's a big difference between the first century ancient Near East 
understanding and practice of material things and consumerism and materialism today. But my friends, what has not changed ever and will not change is the human heart, which the Bible describes as fallen because of sin and untrustworthy. You know, this uh, mantra we have in our culture, follow your heart, is a pretty unwise thing. You know, Jeremiah the prophet said this about the human heart, our hearts. The heart is deceitful, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? And, and indeed, who can understand it? Well, you know what? Jeremiah tells us who. Verse uh, 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 10 of Jeremiah 17. I, Yahweh, I the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man and woman and child according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. God understands and knows the hearts of all people at all time in every place. We can find an example of this in Matthew chapter 19, right here in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 16 to 22. And there we have the events of the rich young man going to Jesus, and he asked Jesus this question in verse 16 of chapter 19. He said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Now Jesus, knowing the rich young man's heart, said, Keep the commandments, which the rich man replied, saying that he had kept them all. He had kept them all. Then Jesus asked a very interesting question. Tell, ask, no, actually told him to do something that's very interesting. He said, go sell what you possess and give uh, to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Verse 21, chapter 19. Matthew records this rich young man's response by saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So now, did you see what Jesus did? The rich young man said he had kept all the commandments outwardly. He didn't say outwardly, but that's what he was doing, outwardly. Just like the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees did outwardly. And many people do today outwardly, these fans of Jesus. But he made his possessions as God, which is a violation in Judaism, to the, is a viol, not a violation in Judaism, in the Bible, of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. And it's actually a violation of, uh, of the second commandment of creating an idol before you. Money became an idol, it became a god for this man. He believed that his self-righteous works would give him eternal life, despite this god he had created in his life. And how many say the same thing today, just in a different way? You know, the good things I do will earn me a pass into heaven. Well, how about you and me? Where do we place the value of our possessions, our money, and those things? Do we trust our possession and our money more than we trust God? Someone once said about our culture's consumeristic drive, quote, so when you get right down to it, your house is nothing more than a place to keep stuff while you go out and get more. More stuff, stuff you don't want, stuff you don't need, stuff you can't, pardon me, stuff you can't afford. Does our attitude toward possession and money reveal, possessions and money reveal God gets all the glory or God gives all the blessings? And God gives all the blessings. Remember what Jesus said here in Matthew 6, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He also said further on down in, chapter, in verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either will hate the one and love the other and he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Money? Uh, fo- money. That's right, money. Folks, <laughs> this, i got to get my thoughts straightened out here. If your money, if my money and our possessions possess us, then how can we give God all the glory to Him? You know, it's interesting as we look at our high-tech, uh, super fast, in many ways, materialistic, consumeristic, Western culture, we see people so often anxious about all sorts of things, you know, from their health, from the stuff they can or can't buy, so many other things. And, you know, the Bible understands and describes this. It says, sinful human nature, the world system, and the enemy of our souls, Satan has convinced people that these things, these careers, this fame, this influence, this money, this busyness, will bring fulfillment and contentment and calm the anxious heart. But it's so interesting how experience and reality reveals quite the opposite. Jesus said, Do not be anxious about your life, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
Well, as we bring this to a close, what are, what are we to do? Are we to live like fans of Jesus, seeking the benefits only? And then I have to ask the question, are you actually even saved? Or are we to be followers of Jesus, trusting in Jesus? You see, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount would say to followers of Jesus today, live your ordinary lives and days, seeking to give God all the glory. And by faith in God alone, trusting God that he will give you all that you need, that God indeed gives the blessings in our lives. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Matthew's gospel. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Oh, Lord, where would we be without your son? We would be in a terrible, terrible place. Thank you, Lord, that there's a message here, not only of hope, but of salvation. And I pray that anyone is hearing this, uh, that if they have not put their full faith and trust in Christ, that they would consider that, that they would ask God to open up the eyes of their heart and their mind and bring them to repentance unto salvation, that they would trust Jesus, not only for the forgiveness of sins, but with their lives in their everyday existence. We thank you, Lord, again, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. Have a great day. Shalom.